Good morning. Welcome to all of you in the sanctuary as well as those who are online. This morning, we're going to read from the Psalms 29. Can you please stand up and we will read it together? Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf, and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare, and his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Let us pray. God, we come to you this morning. We praise you. We say you are mighty. You are glorious. You are full of power, full of majesty. And you give strength to your people. And you bless your people with peace. Lord, we praise you that you are worthy to be praised and you are glorious this morning as we gather lord we invite your holy spirit to be present here with us that our gathering will bring a smile to your face we thank you that you are present here you are with each one we thank you for your loving kindness and your goodness and you are our shield and our protector thank you lord for being here with us we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. And let's sing this together, your voice in thunder.
are worthy of our praise, Lord. You're worthy of our attention, our hearts cry. We know that you're here with us. And so we sing these songs, Lord, because you are enthroned. Not because we want you to be, but because you are these things. The earth belongs to you and everything that's in it. And so we give you praise, God, for being our creator and our sustainer. We love you, Lord, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. Good morning and good afternoon, church family. As you can see, I'm speaking to you from my living room today. All my children ended up testing positive for COVID. And I also have a little bit of lingering flu symptoms. So out of abundance of caution, we decided to pre-record this portion of our worship today. I'm so glad that you're able to join us, whether online or in person. And I really do look forward to being with you next week. Now, uh, as my first message for this new year, uh, 2022, I want to explore the sacred and ancient practice of Sabbath. And yes, uh, you're thinking I just spent the last six weeks of 2021 enjoying my Sabbath break. So it makes sense for me to talk about this. Now, I want to be very upfront with you. My Sabbath was not a picture-perfect, social media-worthy, um, the typical extended family vacations or exotic fishing trips I love to take. I did have a very special time in Italy with Sandy and Abigail for just a few days, uh, but the rest of the time was not that exciting. Many of you were praying that I would be productive in finishing my dissertation, and it did not happen either. For many days, I was upset, frustrated, and anxious because I was stuck in a foreign country with this sickness that has profoundly changed our way of life and all our plans. Uh, even after coming home, I had to rely on medicine to fight constant fatigue and coughing, inability to focus, and the worst of it all was this sense that I did not accomplish anything during my sabbatical. And in that struggle, the Lord had to teach me something that is very foundational. Something that I thought I already knew how to do very well. Uh, I actually did take my time off. I developed a very healthy rhythm for ministry and life. And even during this time, I did rest. Some days sleeping 14 to 16 hours. And even after my return, I was home pretty much 24-7 for a good two weeks trying to get better. But my heart was not at rest. In fact, I realized how restless I had become. There was this constant feeling of, I got to do something. I, I'm not being useful at all. A few days of just lounging around is okay, but after six weeks, I started feeling guilty about not being able to produce anything. And my whole sense of self-worth began to shake. Many of you have experienced something like this when you are going through major transitions in life, waiting for an answer from your college application, or graduating from college and waiting on a new job. Maybe some of you are in that situation right now. What I want to talk to you about today is not just this act of resting as how we have typically understood Sabbath, but really a way of living our lives from this deep restedness of our soul. Those of you who have taken long vacations understand that rest does not guarantee restedness. Lots of sleeping, eating, having fun do not take away restlessness and anxiety of our hearts. Hebrews chapter 4 that we just read today is a remarkable passage that teaches us about the secret of rest, or a better term is restedness, as I've been using it. This is not a light matter. It's not an optional or discretionary luxury that we get to enjoy when we have time. The very reason why Jesus came was to give us rest. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. How many of you feel weary and exhausted today? A record number of people are quitting their job, 
and trying to figure out how to find this rest for their souls. We feel the constant pressure and burden of succeeding and accomplishing what we have to do to get to that next thing or place in life. How many of us have gone through those sleepless nights thinking about tomorrow, next week, or that next test or deadline? You know that dropping everything and going fishing or sleeping in will not really give you that restfulness. Jesus says, learn from me. Come under my yoke. There is a way to find this rest for our souls. This is why Jesus came, and not just to save us from the future wrath of God, but from the present curse of restlessness, peaceless life, laden with anxiety, fear, and hopelessness. According to Hebrews chapter 4, there are three things uh, that are unique about the Sabbath that we practice. I want to quickly highlight those three points to help us understand why resting alone will not lead us to true restedness of our soul. Let's look at what Hebrews chapter 4 says about this Sabbath rest. Number one, this is not just a future promise, but a present reality. Verse 1 does say that it's a promise. The promise of entering this rest still stands, so let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Uh, but verse 3 also tells us that we have believed, we who have believed enter that rest. And the author talks about uh, those who have not yet entered that rest because of their disobedience. Now, some have argued that this Sabbath rest is what we, ent uh, what we enter when we die, the eternal life, paradise. But verse 6 reminds us that this rest is available to us today. And it is our heart's choice whether to enter or not when we hear the gospel. Number two, uh, this rest is exclusively for the people of God. In verse 9, it says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. First of all, this is not a lifestyle or discipline we can develop. It's a privilege that God has availed only to His people. Every society, culture, and generation understands the importance of rest, and they practice it when they can. But that is not what this book is talking about. Thirdly, it takes work to enter this rest. Verse 11 says, Therefore, make every effort to enter this rest, so that no one perish by following their example of disobedience. Now, this verse is already stressing me out. To enter this rest you have to strive. That's what the word actually means, to make every effort. It's going to be a battle to enter this rest. There is a war that is waging against our soul so that you and I may never get to enjoy the Sabbath rest that God has for us. Why I call this message a paradox, a contradiction, because it's not really what we thought it was. So briefly, I want to explore with you what this Sabbath rest is and talk about how to enter this rest. We're going to define what this Sabbath rest is by understanding what it is not. Firstly, it's not a day. By this I mean the Sabbath, yes, is a day that God set apart. Uh, but Sabbath rest is not something we get to experience only one day a week. Most Christians have understood Sabbath as Sunday or the day of our worship. I want you to know that most Sundays I'm working. I wake up with a heavy burden uh, to speak to you about God's heart on, on His behalf. Most Sundays, after I'm done, I crash. Uh, that's why we take our Mondays off. But what I want you to understand is that the purpose of Sabbath is not just to give us a day to recover from six days of hard work. If that's all there is to Sabbath, we are no different than the rest of the world. In fact, the world probably does a far better job unwinding and having fun than most of us Christians. Secondly, Sabbath is not about what we do or not do. To a Jew, it was. When you read books like Exodus or Deuteronomy, God gave clear instructions as what they could or could not do on the day of Sabbath. 
They could not gather or harvest or do the normal things that they do to sustain their life. That's why they could not go out and gather manna on the seventh day. They had to do it on the sixth day. Uh, but rabbis thought that those were not very clear, so they added a whole bunch of others to the list or their own interpreta interpretations of what the law was. For example, uh, they couldn't pick a gray hair as it was considered harvesting. They couldn't kill a flea as it was considered hunting. They couldn't eat an egg laid by a hen as the hen had already broken the commandment. Now, it sounds absurd, but this kind of practice continued on for thousands of years until the Reformation came and the leaders of the Reformation gave a new name to Sunday and called it Continental Sunday and pretty much said, no more restriction. You can do anything on Sunday as long as you come together to worship God. Now, Puritans did not agree with this. So they gave a new name and called it Victoria Sunday and went back to observing the ancient do's and don'ts. So the only toy that was allowed for children, for Puritans, to play with on Sunday was Noah's Ark. The only book that they were allowed to read on Sunday besides the Bible was Pilgrim's Progress. They went even beyond what the Jews practiced and forbid Christians from laughing or playing. All started with just a simple law. It used to be called blue laws. That's why for centuries we had business close on Sundays. That is no longer the case in most states. But all these things were done out of godly intention to please and honor God. But we lost the meaning of the true Sabbath because we missed one very important point. The point of all this is why. People became obsessed with what of the Sabbath law and totally missed why God gave it to us in the first place. We find it in Exodus 31, chapter 12, verse 12 and following. Uh, it says, first of all, it says, observe the Sabbath day. And then God reminds Moses, this is a sign. This will be a sign between you and me for generations to come so that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. This is probably one of the most important verses that we need to understand for what this Sabbath was really for. God says it's a sign. It's not a real thing, but it signifies something. What is it signifying? That He's the Lord who sanctifies us. Now, some translations say, so that you may know that I am holy, but I think that translation falls awfully short of what God is really trying to tell us here. The word to sanctify is not just to make things clean, but also to elevate, to set apart, to make holy what is common or ordinary. So when God gave this law to the people of Israel, it was a sign to a, a greater reality that God was elevating them, setting them apart from the rest of the world, making people who were once not only common, but slaves who had no privilege of rest, and making them like himself, giving them the divine privilege of rest. If you go back to Genesis chapter 2, you find how God created the whole world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. But it's interesting that God did not give the same command to Adam and Eve. In fact, the Sabbath law does not come into effect until Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. So there are only two possibilities. One, God did not really want Adam and Eve to enjoy this gift of Sabbath, or they already had it. And only through their fall that they for, uh, forfeited their Sabbath's rest. This is actually what happened. Sabbath is really a divine way of life, something that God could only do, something that reserved only for the Creator, the all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present God, who's all-sufficient, who has no need, he can rest and the world that he created can still go on. And he wanted to share this kind of life with his people, people who have been slaves for 400 years, people like you and me who were born into this world as slaves to sin, shame, fear, and anxiety. Sabbath rest is an invitation to participate in God's divine life and privilege. It's not an activity or inactivity, but a state of mind, soul, and heart. 
It's our God-given ability to silence and overcome our worries and fears that lead to a life of anxiousness. I was meditating on Psalm chapter 3. I think it was on our daily reading on Tuesday. And listen to what he says. This is a perfect picture of Sabbath rest. It says, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying to me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, the lifter of my head. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Now, David wrote this song near the end of his reign. His life was falling apart. This was the beginning of the demise of his family, his throne, his kingdom that God had already prophesied. His own son is coming after him to overtake the throne. The enemies he's talking about in verse 1 is his own son who has gathered a massive army around him to take down his own father. I want you to just think about the state of David's heart. And yet in the midst of this horrible situation, he's saying, I'm able to lie down and sleep because the Lord sustains me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You know, David knew how to practice this. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. That is the Sabbath rest that only God the Father can give to us. Jesus said some horrible things to his disciples near the end of his life, that he would be crucified and that the world would hate them in the same way that they hated him. Then he said, remember in John chapter 14, peace I leave with you. Not the kind of peace that the world gives. Now this shalom peace is the restedness of our soul that comes from not only believing but also knowing that God is with us and he's for us. And nothing in my life is outside of his goodness and his mercy. So how do we enter this rest? It is very simple. And yet, very, very difficult. Uh, that is why Hebrews chapter 4 reminds us that we have to make every effort to enter this rest. This is why I had to fight for my peace during my stay in Rome, trying to settle my anxious heart, bringing myself under this hidden and incomprehensible reality of God. I'll keep it very simple. We enter this rest by knowing who we are, and whose we are. Now, we have spent a lot of time in the past talking about our sonship, our daughterhood. Almost every conference we, we do talk about our identity as children of God. This is important. This is the beginning point. That's hard enough for us to fully believe to this day. And yet, I want to tell you, it is not enough just to know that you are a child of God. That knowledge alone will not guarantee you of this shalom peace or Sabbath rest. You must also come to know the one whom you belong to. Much of our anxiety and restlessness uh, come not from the lack of understanding of our own identity, but from the lack of understanding of who our Father really is. We know God only in academic sense, but we don't have the real or enough experience of His deep love, His, His mercy, His awesome power, His rule, reign, and influence in everything that is happening around us. The reason why we cannot lie down and sleep at night is because we still think that it's up to us. God doesn't have my back or he doesn't have what it takes to take care of me, so I got to take control. I must look after myself and my family. It's why we cannot rest. The first few days after I tested positive for COVID, all I could think of was how to get out of Rome and come back home. At one point, I don't know if I should tell you this or not, I went out and bought a tube of Vaseline so that if I can just stuff my nose, I would be less infectious and perhaps I could pass the test. <laughs> it didn't work. Twice. As embarrassed as I am, this is really how most of us approach life. When we get sick, 
when we get into hard and confusing situations, our default response is to get ourselves out of the situation rather than acknowledging God, who is the Lord of Sabbath, who has power over my life and all of my reality. The reason why we cannot rest is because we do not come to God of the God of rest until we run out of our own resources. God is still merciful. He still embraces us just like the father who ran to his son, threw his arms, and kissed the son who came after squandering all of his wealth, restless and weary, broken. I want to end with this one powerful story of how John Wesley found his Sabbath rest and became instrumental in starting one of the greatest revivals we know that gave birth to what is known to us as holiness movement. Wesley grew up as a son of a minister, a pastor's kid. He was a deeply religious man, but his whole life he strived to attain this righteousness that he read about in the Bible. If you read some of his writings and confessions, you will find that he went through the same struggles that you and I go through every day almost. He always felt something was missing in his life, always feeling like He's never measuring up. This led to a life of service as a missionary to America. He decided to go and preach the gospel to Americans. Before his trip, he wrote, this is what he said, My chief motive is the hope of saving my own soul. I hope to learn the true sense of the gospel of Christ by preaching to the heathen. Now, you understand he was already a Christian. He was a preacher. And yet, he's try, still trying to save his own soul by doing good works, by becoming a missionary to America, and by preaching to the heathens. But his true conversion or experience of this peace came on the night he was on the ship, when the ship actually ran into a severe storm. There were about 80 Englishmen and 26 Moravian Christians on this ship. When the wind tore through the main sail of the ship, a terrible screaming broke out among the English. You can imagine the fear and panic. Then he heard the Moravian brothers, the missionaries, singing with radiant joy, going about fixing the broken sail. No commotion, no fear or anxiety, only this strange peace that Wesley had never seen or known before. So Wesley approached them and asked one of them, were you afraid? And he responded, I thank God, no. Then he asked Wesley, have you the witness within your spirit that you are a child of God? And do you know Jesus Christ? Shocked and perplexed, Wesley asked again, weren't your women and children afraid? And the man replied, no, our women and children are not afraid to die. Then he wrote these words in his own journal. He said, from this, these Moravians, I went to the, their crying and trembling neighbors, the English, and pointed out, to the difference in the hour of trial between him that fears God and him that fears him not. At 12, the wind fell, and this was the most glorious day which I have ever seen. Now, there are more journal entries written about his observations, interactions, and encounters with these Moravian Christians in the next several years. But it was this encounter this moment that Wesley was set free from his own fear and striving to find rest for his soul. I want to end with the same question that the Moravian brother asked Wesley that night in the middle of this terrible and scary storm. Do you have the witness of the Spirit within you that you are a child of God? And do you know Jesus Christ? Has this reality really become the source of your rest and your shalom peace? Are you able to lie down at night? Are you able to sleep? I don't know or understand the hardship or challenges you might be facing in this season. It's been hard, scary, and confusing for many of us. And I'm praying for you today that God would not just simply deliver you from your circumstances or hardship, but you will learn in the season from Christ how to enter and stay in this restedness of your soul. That this will become not just one day a week experience or one hour a day discipline, but an ongoing experience that sustains you with peace 
joy and this deep sense of righteousness in the Holy Spirit. That is the divine invitation from the Father today. As we approach this table of the Lord, let's say yes to this invitation. Let's bring our discouragements, our disappointments, anxiety, fears, and exchange them with this peace that Jesus promises through His Holy Spirit. Let's live out of this restedness that God wants to give us today. I want to bless you with this peace of Christ. As a response to that, you can reflect through it. I think the words will be up there. Um, but if not, you can just listen. And then we'll, uh, we'll eat together at this table. Come out of sadness from wherever you Uh, I just want to remind you that, um, that the Apostle Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians 11. That it says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This table has uh, no greater invitation to rest for us. That because of the body and blood of Jesus, we have rest from uh, sickness. We have rest from um, our anxiety and our worry. And a rest that doesn't come from circumstances being fixed, but a rest that comes in Jesus. And so, church family, let's take this bread together. This is the body of Christ, broken for us. By his wounds we are healed, and in him we find our rest. Let's eat together with grateful hearts.
Church, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together with thankful hearts. invited us into that rest with you. That it's not a place or activity or non-activity, but it's you. It's your presence. It's your person. You give us rest. So we thank you for the reminder today at the table that you won that rest for us at the cross. God, you are Lord of creation and we, uh, we trust you for everything that we need to walk with you. Whether, in, uh, whether we're sick or we're healthy, we trust you be to, to be the Lord um, of the promise that you are our healer, our sanctifier, our coming king. We give you praise and glory and honor this morning. We love you, Jesus. And we pray this in your name, amen. Go in peace today, church.